So what do you do when you have to choose between fascism and Nazism? Hard choice? Well, if only one of them comes with independence, you might take that one. This is what conservative politician Engelbert Dolfus does when he decides to become fascist dictator of Austria in 1934. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. In 1934, Austria is a reduced power, struggling to stay independent from Germany. The country faces persistent financial challenges after being rocked by the German banking crisis which actually started in Austria with the collapse of Austria's biggest bank, Credit Sanstalt, in 1931. It is also plagued by political violence from armed militias of the communists, social democrats, conservatives, fascists, and Nazis. And caught in a vice between the Italian fascists and the German Nazis, domestic policy is increasingly divisive in this landlocked, mountainous little country that was, until just a few months ago, a nascent democracy. But of course, this isn't how it's always been. In fact, for several centuries, Austria's power was the envy of Central Europe. It was the dominant state of the Holy Roman Empire, and then one of the five great European powers in the 19th century. Although ruled by a German-speaking elite centered around the Habsburg dynasty, it was a multilingual and multicultural empire. Its millions of subjects ranged from Germans to Croats to Italians to Poles to Czechs to many, many more. But as the rising tide of national feeling began to spread across Europe, this diversity would prove to be its downfall. Calls for independence grow louder and louder, and Austria even loses significant chunks of territory in the second half of the 19th century. Mounting pressure from another German-speaking great power, Prussia, also threatens the empire. When the idea of a unified pan-Germanic nation starts to gain popularity after the 1848 revolutions, the struggle, led by Prussia, towards this goal risks marginalizing Vienna's power. The pan-German movement had always been influential in the Austrian Empire, but not powerful enough to counter the Austrocentric view of the leadership. Eventually, the German question leads to war between Austria and the Prussian-led German states in 1866. The Prussian side comes out better, and to counter its own decline, Austria is forced to agree to the elevation of the Kingdom of Hungary as an equal partner. The dual kingdom, the dual monarchy of Austria and Hungary, or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is formed. The two sides mostly run things independently of each other, apart from foreign policy and military matters which come under joint oversight. The Habsburgs also remain as the ruling imperial dynasty. But the union does not save Austria. In the end, the separatist emotions plaguing the empire, combined with pressure from neighboring countries, contribute to pushing Austria-Hungary and the rest of the world into the conflict that will be the Habsburg's downfall, the Great War. After the war, the treaties of Saint-Germain and Trianon split the dual kingdoms and the empire is dismantled. Austria loses most of its non-German-speaking territories. But even some German-speaking regions are snatched away. Thing is, to some degree, an effect of complicated ethnic borderlands made it impossible to draw a border that will satisfy all national groups. For example, the Sudetenland goes to Czechoslovakia, but it is not, and never has been, a geopolitical reality. Instead, it's a loosely defined region populated by ethnic Germans, which straddles the provinces of Moravia and Bohemia. In fact, the term Sudetenland only enters common usage in the 1920s, arising from a need to categorize what is now under threat. The once mighty empire is now suddenly a landlocked republic, stripped of much of its industry. This immediately raises questions over its viability, and nationalist affinity with a similarly neutered Germany leads to hopes of unification. The Allies have already seen this coming, though, forbidding such a union in the treaties of Versailles and Saint-Germain. Nevertheless, for many Austrians, unification still seems the only means of survival. But this isn't the only cause of friction in the country. Austrian politics is dominated by two parties whose political rhetoric could not be more opposed. On one side is the Social Democrats. Though reformist and moderate in practice, the party regularly espouses Marxist ideals of class warfare in speeches and newspapers. 
Such rhetoric strikes fear into the hearts of many devout Catholics and landowners, driving them towards the conservative Christian Social Party. This is likely what makes the Christian Socials the strongest party in the country. In the 1920s, they produced the majority of federal chancellors. But there is no end to the people happy to challenge that power. One such person is Walter Primer, leader of a regional chapter of the Heimwehr, a paramilitary organization similar to Germany's Freikorps. Now, like many Heimwehr leaders, Primer is disdainful of parliamentary democracy. Unlike many Heimwehr leaders, Primer is also hostile to the Christian Social Party, whose Austrian nationalism is anathema to his pan-German dreams. No doubt hoping to replicate Mussolini's seizure of power, on September 13, 1931, Primer stages a coup, marching Hysteria Heimwehr unit on Vienna. But the whole affair is pretty poorly organized, and the coup is suppressed quickly by authorities in just one day, earning Primer the title of the half-day dictator. The Christian socials have lived to see another day. But on May 20th, 1932, they appoint a new chancellor who will change the fortunes of the Austrian Republic forever. Engelbert Dolphus is born in Texing in 1892, the illegitimate son of a peasant couple. Despite his humble beginnings, he excels in school and his enthusiasm as an altar boy leads to his parish priest securing a scholarship for him to study at a religious school. In 1913, he travels to the University of Vienna to study for the priesthood, but ends up dropping out and studies law instead. His studies are interrupted by the Great War, which he insists on fighting despite technically being too short to do so. You see, Dolphus is only 150 centimeters tall, which is five centimeters below the minimum height requirement. Nevertheless, he fights valiantly in the war. His wartime experience instills in him a strong sense of an Austrian nation as something separate from Germany, returning from the front fully committed to the Austrian Republic. He also continues his studies, spending a year in Berlin on a scholarship from the Lower Austrian Peasant League, an arm of the Christian Social Party. Upon his return, he becomes the organization's secretary. He is instrumental in reforming the Provincial Agricultural Council into the Chamber of Agriculture of Lower Austria, eventually becoming its director in 1927. He now starts a rapid rise in politics, becoming Minister of Federal Railways in 1930, Minister of Agriculture in 1931. In May 1932, he becomes Chancellor at the head of a conservative coalition led by his party. Throughout his political life, Dolphus has considered the peasantry to be the most crucial segment of society. In his worldview, the peasants form the foundation of a nation. In November 1932, he declares that our struggle for existence would be for naught if the most important, indeed the only basis for the state were lost, namely German customs and the Catholic faith, which are most thoroughly anchored in the peasantry. His political philosophy is critical of liberal capitalism and instead infuses Catholicism and the worship of peasantry with a socio-economic system of corporatism, which essentially advocates that society should be organized into corporate groups that work like human organs to contribute to the overall health of the nation, but can be quickly ruled by a select group. Like the rest of his Christian socials, he is a committed Austrian nationalist. However, he has become chancellor at a time of rising pan-German sentiment. In fact, he's even forced to form a coalition government with the Landbund, a German nationalist party with a mostly Protestant electoral base. Luckily for Dolphus, their influence is muted somewhat by another coalition partner, the Heimatblock, the political wing of the Heimwehr, who are much more sympathetic to Austrian nationalism. They vow to drag Austria out of the economic slump it has found itself in since the Great Depression. This has caused widespread dissatisfaction throughout the country, no doubt contributing to the steadily growing national socialist movement. Dissatisfied Heimwehr members have swelled its ranks since Primer's failed push, and the Nazis of the Austrian Nazis, the German Nationalist Socialist Party, DNSAP, now adds to an already complicated political militia landscape. The Heimwehr have been opposed by the Social Democrat Militia, the Republikanische Schutzbund, the Republican Protection League. They, in turn, do not only recruit from the Social Democrats, but also from the KPO, the Communists. The League now found itself opposed both to the Heimwehr and the Nazis, who are opposed to each other. Fighting all of them 
is the Freiheitsbund, the Freedom League, a conservative-based militia like the Heimwehr. However, unlike the Heimwehr, the Freedom League is firmly dedicated to protecting liberal democracy, while also putting up violent resistance to the left. But Dolphus soon gets an opportunity to counter the rising Nazi tide. On March 4th, 1933, the National Council, the lower house of parliament, is debating how to solve an ongoing railway worker strike. The final vote is expected to be extremely close. So much so that political decisions are taken to win the vote that will result in the parliament literally eliminating itself. Now, let me explain, okay? The constitutional makeup of the First Republic is pretty complicated, but basically, the National Council has a president as well as a second and third president who together are responsible for running political affairs and administrative proceedings. The presidents are elected and belong to political parties just like every other National Council member, but they are not allowed to vote, right? Okay, following uproar about a previous ballot, Karl Renner resigns from his position as first president so that he can give his Social Democrat party an extra vote. Second president Rudolf Ramek takes up his post, but he too then resigns so he can cast his vote for the Christian Social Party. Third president Sepp Strafner is now in charge of things, but as you probably have already guessed, he too resigns so that he can vote for his greater German People's Party. The National Council now finds itself well, having a bit of a problem. You see, there has to be a sitting president for a vote to take place, but they've all resigned so they can vote. So parliament has effectively become paralyzed and Dolphus, hardly sympathetic to democratic tradition in the first place, seizes his chance. Claiming that the ongoing crisis is not provided for in the constitution, he puts the council out of session. Using the 1917 wartime economy authority law, he seizes power to ensure that it would be the last session. He claims that he has done this following what he terms the self-elimination of the parliament but it is nothing short of a coup d'etat. The law curtails freedom of the press and freedom of assembly, beginning the process which will see Austria slide into a dictatorship. In fact, Dolphus has more or less instituted a fascist or rather an Austro-fascist regime. As we have seen before, fascism can be a pretty hard concept to define and Austro-fascism has some pretty unique characteristics to it. It develops out of two strands. First is Dolphus's own staunchly conservative and nationalist Christian social party. It has strong traditions of anti-Semitism, anti-socialism, anti-liberalism. The second strand comes from the fear generated by the Marxist revolutions in Hungary and Bavaria in 1919. These events seem to confirm that the specter of communism really is haunting Europe. Now many look to Italian fascism as a way to counter that, even more like its Italian inspiration Austro-fascism is both clerical and corporatist in nature. Central to its ideology is the belief that Austria must remain Catholic. This partly explains why it is so anti-German, because Germany is a country dominated politically by Prussian Protestants. Although some Austro-fascists do have common ground with the German Nazis, Dolphus simply cannot afford the Nazis making any gains in his Austrian homeland. Following the communal elections in Innsbruck in May 1933, which sees the Austrian Nazis gain 40% of the vote, he takes drastic action. State and communal polls are banned. Parliament is dissolved, and Dolphus establishes the Vaterlandische Front, the Patriotic Front. In typical fascist rhetoric, the new party purportedly represents a transcending of partisan ideology. And to make it a little easier to transcend, Dolphus also ensures the other parties are banned from participating in politics. He also forbids the militia, specifically the Social Democrat and Communist League, although they do continue to exist in the background. Several of the actual parties themselves are next. The Communist Party goes on May 27th, and following a Nazi hand grenade attack in Krems, killing one and wounding close to 30, the DNSAP are banned in June. But this does not stop the Nazi movement's threat to an independent Austria. With financial aid from Germany, its terrorism continues throughout the year, resulting in a death toll of five, but dozens more injured. Leading DNSAP members also flee to Bavaria to found the Austrian Legion to prepare to re-enter their homeland via an invasion. 
Now resistance to the Dolphus regime is coming from multiple fronts. Social Democrats are still taking to the streets to protest and are often accompanied by armed members of the Forbidden League. In February 1934, the League finally attempts to take down the Dolphus government and the brief but violent Austrian civil war begins. In the space of less than a week, Heimwehr and League forces clash throughout Austria's cities. Hundreds die, thousands are wounded. But Dolphus emerges victorious, cracks down on all hostilities, and uses the crisis to increase and consolidate his power. A few months later, he proclaims the May Constitution. This formally abolishes democracy, while also bringing the Catholic Church into the center of political life, declaring that all laws come from God on high. Now, Nazi Germany may be a constant threat to an independent Austria, but fascist Italy proves itself a perhaps surprising ally. In March 1934, Italy, Hungary, and Austria sign a bunch of agreements in Rome. These Rome protocols are mainly economic, but are a clear sign to Adolf Hitler that the Southern Catholic countries are a united bloc not to be messed with. It's not actually that surprising that Mussolini is willing to leave Hitler in the cold. His ideology of Italian exceptionalism is pretty much at odds with Nazi beliefs in a superior Germanic race. More importantly, he's concerned about Italian territorial integrity. In the very north of Italy lives a sizable German minority, constituting a majority in southern Tyrol. Now, Hitler's race-motivated expansionism means that he clearly has his eyes on these lands. Dolphus, however, does not, giving Mussolini a vital buffer against Hitler's greater Germanic Reich. In April 1933, Mussolini even told Dolphus that if necessary, Italy would defend Austria's independence by force of arms. Dolphus takes this to heart, and strengthened in his confidence, he makes it unmistakably clear that he is opposed to a Nazi incursion into Austria. Hardly a man to let things slide, Hitler ramps up Nazi activities in Austria. Things come to a violent head on July 25, 1934, when 154 men from the Austrian SS all trained by the army but dismissed because of their Nazi connections, break into the Chancellery building in Vienna. Now, rumors have been flying for quite some time that something like this is going to happen. So Dolphus is immediately alerted. His cabinet members flee, but he does not and stays to resist. He's soon shot and critically wounded. The Nazis are by now caught in a standoff with the army and the police. Dolphus asks for medical treatment and then the last rites. The Nazis deny his pleas, a few hours into the push, he dies. Meanwhile, a radio station is captured and a broadcast goes out declaring the formation of a Nazi government and a call for a general uprising. Upon hearing the news, Mussolini, whose wife has actually been entertaining the rest of the Dolphus family, is furious. He immediately denounces the push and threatens war with Germany in defense of Austria. Now, we don't actually know the exact role Hitler plays in these events, but regardless of his direct involvement, he now professes Germany's innocence in the whole affair. So the Nazi government occupying the Viennese chancellery is suddenly left without any support, denounced by the party and the man who they just killed a political leader for. They surrender that evening and they are subsequently executed. We do know that the plan had been for SA units to stage uprisings across the country, but poor planning and SASS rivalry got in the way of this. There are a few bloody skirmishes over the next days, but this is nothing close to the revolution they had hoped for. Overall, the July push has left close to 300 people killed and many more injured. It is a bit of an embarrassing failure for the Nazis. They expected the army and the police to be on their side, but they mostly stayed loyal to the Austrian state. Thousands of Nazi party members are now also thrown into detention camps. Nevertheless, it has shaken Austria to its core. Kurt Schuschnigg succeeds Dolphus as Austria's leader. He will, for the most part, continue the work of his predecessor, desperately trying to keep Catholic Austria independent from the Third Reich. He will, however, find himself increasingly isolated on the international stage and be forced to adopt like the rest of the European powers, a policy of appeasement towards the ever-encroaching Nazi state. 
And when that power, the Nazi German Reich, marches into Austria, it will be to the tune of millions of Austrians hailing the new rise of the German race. Despite Dolphus, despite Schuschnigg, millions will join the Nazis. Eventually, countless Austrians will participate and even lead the Nazi terror machine. We've made an episode about the fascist movement in general, and it will be right here any moment now. Our Time Ghost Army member for this episode is Colm Macnialis, or something similar to Colm Macnialis. It's thanks to our Time Ghost Army members, though, their contributions that we can continue to shine a light on these often forgotten events. And if, like the Austrians, you find yourself looking down the barrel of a gun, remember Harvey Specter's thoughts about not being out of choices. You take the gun or you pull out a bigger one, or you call their bluff, or you do any one of 146 other things. Post.